cliche, but it's still for me pours out information. And it's sort of I'm a sentimentalist, I guess, in terms of change. And I see something like this as a loss, as like an orphan, as a building that was made. The purpose has been become obsolete, and now it's like a lost object. And we were talking tonight at dinner, like. I have this overwhelming sense that there's more art, and there's more poetry, and there's more fiction, and there's more film, there's more everything that's ever going to ever be seen in the universe. There's The audience isn't as big as the productivity in every art form. And it's kind of this thing that I always notice, and it's sort of sad, like there's all these poets out there writing, pouring their hearts out with these really intense poems, and who's going to read them? You know, we're all watching TV, and so it's... It's one of those things that you, you realize, and it's kind of there's nothing you can do about it. But the benefit is that you you get to see it everywhere you go, you know, on the screen. You know. This is a, a painting I did a couple of years ago. It's called In the Beginning, and for me, this this is one of those source material things where I did it really spontaneously. Like, um, this is um, not I did it from a drawing, but it was. But, painting that I did acrylic on canvas, which is very, you know, you know, just drawing and painting and like making it happen really quickly. And I think it's sort of about the process of building, which is, I guess, on a real basic level, the process of making art. You know, there's a tree stump, and there's two by fours strung and nailed to it. So like, the very first act that people do is make things. You know, whether they're children or whether they're, um, cavemen or whether they're, it's just, it's one of those things that always makes me think that people in general make things, and you can see it in museums, and you can see it in art galleries, and it's just people that are not artists still make things, and um, I just love that idea, and there's, I could go through hundreds of pictures like this where an object has been turned into, through neglect and weather and time, to just something that looks like what is that? And there's so many things that I could do. I could just talk about, I could just hold this slide and probably talk for an hour. You know, I was, I was, it makes me laugh and it's sort of, um, you know, you talk about so many things. But I have a lot of slides, so I'm going to try to go through them quickly. Um, there, there are things like human, the human, the human, you know, when people do things, they there's this idea of utility. Um, you know, in order to get where we want to go, we make something that this is basically a, 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 a shelter for someone to work on their yacht throughout the winter and sail along. So inside that thing, there's like there's a sailboat or there's a power boat in there and they're working on. So that it's like in order to get this, you get this, and um, like this door. The design element was which was drawn on paper has been augmented with a series of events that have happened over time. And I always think that's, for me, that's sort of like art. And I, I notice it everywhere. And it's um, endearing. And like design, I was talking about this. And that again, right, people, you make, you take the most utilitarian object, like I was at the museum today, and there's like arrowheads, and there's <coughs> stone sledges, and there's all these, you know, fishing hooks that are made by hand. But there's this people take the care to make this airhead look like this beautiful symmetrical thing and like why do we do it? This is like a basic like a trailer you know, so like this radical insane um, design element. Um, so these are just things that I see that um, stop me in my tracks and this is this kind of goes into um, I think the idea that People turn, tend to collect, and, and objects tend to collect next to each other, so it's like a molecule. There's a gravity to things. You put one large thing in the backyard, like you put a wheelbarrow in the backyard. Next thing you know, you put a flower pot in the wheelbarrow. And, and, and in the course of like living, we we select and we put stuff down in order to just organize, and it's like this loop. It's a molecule. It's like the, the thing ends up having this gravity and mixing. You know, everything's sort of like this. It's a it's a pile of all these different things. It's my dog's grave in my backyard. Um, this is like a, a photograph of a, I was driving across the country and, you know, it took them like a hundred pictures, but I can't, it, it's hard for me to select photographs that are more important than another one, but the idea that these words became physical three-dimensional objects and it just, 
kind of blew my mind in a way. And it's not a, I'm not even thinking about the, what is actually being said, but just they're heavy and they're leaning against the wall like that. And it's like a, once you, you get into this headset of seeing, for me, of seeing things that are, I'm, I'm sort of downloading stuff in my, in my mind and it's, uh, it just starts to regenerate, and next thing you know, you're looking at things in this. Uh, I don't know. This kind of makes me really stop. This is a a molecule. Kind of, this is a real typical thing you see in Seattle, where there's a you know a, a truncated tree, and then the, the, the plate, the plate, the, the kid's fort is over there, and then there's a tarp. The next thing you know, the, for me, I made a painting of this, and. I don't worry about how original it is because I know it's not very original and there's a lot of um, things that are going on right now. If you look through art, I, I, mean, I look through art magazines all the time and I see this sort of zeitgeist going on with the architecture, construction, building materials, the inert, and um, it's uh, those, the fact that it's not original or not new doesn't really deter me from looking at it and wanting that stuff. This is sort of like you know, that, that painting in the beginning in a way where these are, again, there's like this weird tendency of people to have these trees in their yard and then they truncate it and then they leave it with sort of like this giant toe in there. And um, I'm just sort of fascinated by that. Um, this gets closer to the subject matter of this is in my backyard and um, there's a table and this character interplay between the it's like an operating table and a patient with his neck broken down and his back. <laughs> kind of impotence and um, or like I give up. I have a lot of things where there's that kind of I give up. I quit. I can't do this. And the shovel's going more well, I'm done. <laughs> and it's just stuff that happens. Um, this is a special assignment. This is a drawing that I think I would, when I, I relate these two, and I'm a, I want to make a sculpture of this with using red tile. And, um, so I want to talk about drawing, um, and I know this, when I was in school, I was a rebel, and I thought I was a huge Andy Warhol fan, and in, as far as what I knew about the soul screen that I knew about Andy Warhol, the murals, and the Elvises, and the, um, and whatnot. There was no drawing involved. He, he basically took a photograph and made it in the slip screen and then he would make a painting. So I thought, I don't even want to draw because I love, I want to do that. And so all the way through drawing school, uh, art school, I did not really think of drawing that much as part of what I wanted to do. And it wasn't until 10 years or so after I graduated from school that I started, you know, I was a chronic doodler. And these things would end up on the phone book and on letterheads and everywhere, everywhere. And, uh, my friend Paul, I was living in New York at the time, my friend came over one day and said, you should use these in your art. And I was really insulted by that because my art was all about, I was doing all these, these really um, kind of academic painting shows about the American, American what, the history of America and uh, all these different, uh, the Civil War and American Indian Wars in the West and then the Massachusetts, you know, the land grab and the Puritans and Jamestown, all these different things, and they were great. I would read a bunch of books, and anyway, drawing <coughs> was something I didn't do initially, and then th these were early um, examples of, I was eventually sort of talked into trying to, you know, use, the, the drawing ended up sort of coming into my art, and that's sort of where, I'm, that's the reason I'm doing what I'm doing now, so it's all about drawing, and so I started with photographs, the drawings were sort of like a secondary source material of stuff that I make art from. And without drawing, I wouldn't at all be able to do what I do. And it's kind of like a traditional <coughs> idea that, um, I would, for me, it's been a way to get to um, the stuff that's at the bottom of my brain, the stuff that I don't even know what it is. And it's, um, so I, I take... I draw, you know, I take figure like drawing class now and I still like draw. Uh, so sometimes I'll draw the figures, sometimes I'll do these blue duels, but um, the drawing 
I don't know, I can't explain when it sort of came about, but it was like a, I started to try to do this thing where I would put the pencil or the pen or the marker on the paper and just sort of move it and watch my hand and watch the marker move vertically and consciously try not to make any recognizable shape at all. And um, it's sort of an exercise that I do this. Um, so I call it automatic drawing, or it's sort of like basically just sort of, um, I've got tons of sketchbooks where I just sort of make stuff. I try to make marks that are, it's so hard to do, you know, when you're um, trying to uh, make a drawing that's of nothing. You know, I'm not drawing from life. I'm not drawing from anything I see or anything I'm thinking about or picturing. I'm just making, I'm watching the mark move and seeing which way it goes. And that ends up being the foundation for a lot of the pictures that I've done in the last probably five or eight years. So that's why I'm sort of getting at that right now. It sounds maybe not so interesting, but compared to where I came from, it's, it was a kind of a revelation, like drawing. And of course, all the time that you're in art school, everyone's always talking about drawing. But we were always talking about drawing, set up a still life, do the drawing, sort of. Um, so these are weird totally weird marks that I do and um, and I literally try to draw normally I'm, I'm, I'm doing a whole different project right now I'm working on like a, a public sculpture but normally I get up in the morning and drink coffee and make you know five or ten drawings of something before I start working on the, the paintings that are you know that are waiting for me to like, work on them so um, I don't know how to say it but <laughs> These are, and I'll go through some of them, and I'll, the ones that I like, I will cut them out and put them in the schedule and say this because they're um, interesting. Something ends up um, being recognizable. So that's a whole other process of like working on, that came from a drawing. Um, and this is called Liar. And this is probably nothing, nothing you expected to see because, you know, the, I saw the image of the poster and you probably don't know me from anybody, but there, I think in, when you're making art, you, for me it's been all of the most rewarding times have been when I've actually taken this leap of taking the raw material or the exercise of making drawings and sort of, and, you're, and, you, and you reach out and grab something that's on the periphery and make, make it, and you look at it, you make something that's 3D out of a 2D drawing, and then you look at it and go, huh, and then that's how you get from stepping stone to stepping stone in my book. I mean, you, I, was, I, I feel like without that, if I was just to stick to my linear process of making singular work and moving one, one step at a time, I think I'd be totally, totally different work. For me, the, the advantage and the, the idea of being an artist Going to art school, being an artist, is, is so much about freedom and liberty and adventure that it seems silly to not try to let yourself be free and do something that's really ridiculous or, you know, so it really just took me like, you know, an hour to make and then I looked at it and went, you know, even if it was a complete waste of time to put on the wall, it's only an hour lost. So there's, this is a, a drawing that I, I, this, I put this in as an example of um, where I do the, the first drawing would be in the orange, the ochre color, and I, I sort of try to consciously draw, no, you know, I, I always draw with gravity in mind, so I'm pushing the pencil vertically and I'm thinking of gravity pushing down, and of course it's a structure, and that's just the way I think it's a kind of traditional sort of way of thinking. So it's sort of a figure, but then you do the lighter tone first and then you take the darker tone and I, I come back with the darker with the darker brown and using the initial drawing as a almost as like a, a background to work against. So there's two it's like the left and the right or something like that where the darker the darker line can either embrace the what's underneath it or negate it. So you have a foil in a way. So it's kind of like a I don't know, I think there's certain parts of your brain which understand um, sympathy and rejection. And so using those two levers, it's like a binary way of thinking, like yes, no. I like that and I don't like that. So you making one drawing without without any thinking at all, and the second drawing is sort of like, well, I'm using the first drawing as a way to 
frame the second one. And I don't know, I don't understand what it is, and I don't understand how I, I want to make a painting from this, but I don't, I don't even know where, where, where to start. It's, this is called King, because it has that kind of um, crown at the top. But um, there's a, these are like, I, I've done a lot of drawings with the mouse. And so this is a painting from the mouse drawing. Um, this is a peg, piece of pegboard. Um, and this is an exercise that I do sometimes for fun. Like you limit the drawing capability to dot for dot. You can't, you have to go to dot for dot. And it's sort of like, I don't know, I think the brain is really tricky. And, um, I'm always trying to figure out, or just intuitively try to let, using these little tricks to see what could possibly happen in terms of the, the red and blue and, um, I don't know. In, I think in art school, you're given problems to solve, or you're, or you're creating problems for yourself, and you go, this is what I'm going to do today. And when you're out of school, it becomes your, the, biggest, <coughs> the biggest quiz, the biggest question is what, what it is that's important to you. It's not about how to do it. It's like the, the substance is really bad. Um, so, and I don't know. Drawing is, I think, also really great because it doesn't take much time. You can do something in not much time at all. These are not the mouse drawing. Um, I see that as like a wrought iron sculpture, maybe, but I haven't ever made it, so I keep that going around. These are. This is something that intrigues me because I haven't made anything from this yet, and this is, you know, within a year or so, and I, I don't know what I'm gonna do with that. But for me, it's like a. The reason I like it is because I, I kind of think it's sort of ridiculous and, I don't know, um, I don't know that it's a question mark rather than an um, a, a, a a exclamation mark. It's more like, why is that interesting? These are more drawings. These are, this is another little thing that I do to drum up. Um, Compositions where I do like I'll start in the left and do a I'll do a I'll take the vocabulary of lines or straight lines and curves and just that just that one vocabulary so I'll be able to go up or down the page and go like I'll straight and curve straight curve and then I'll switch to blue and I'll do the same thing and it's this is nothing to me but this leads to then you know you can using that same way of thinking I'm just trying to keep my mind from locking down into something where I I think I know what it is. In order to get something that, um, this is a cloth, so I painted the red paper and let that go, and I just cut it out. But it's the same kind of thinking where it straights and curves. I start on the left and on the right. And, you know, it's, it's only an hour or so of work, but I would do it in the morning. I'm a procrastinator, so I have, like, the bigger paintings that for me are really hard and challenging and scary to work on, I save those for the afternoon. So I get the morning, drink coffee, at breakfast, go out there, walk the dog, and I go in my studio, and I give myself from like 10 to 12 to just mess around making something really like a bomb, like a little collage or a little sculpture or a little drawing. And this is the same thing, the same exact thinking as those red and blue drawings where I'm starting from the left. And for me, this is like a, this is like a, um, this is a series of, people walking left, and they're kind of cubist, modernist, um, wooden sculptures, and it's like pulling out something from nothing for me. You're starting with that abstract, totally abstract lines of straights and curves, and then suddenly your mind goes, that's sort of an anthropomorphic triangle or head, that's an ear, that's a face, that's a leg, and then I think that's where cubism sort of is grounded, and I th and it's again, this is something that's been done a million times. But for me, it was like I had to I had to sort of go through the motions of appreciating this stuff for my own for my own liking, you know, two D and the back using the negative space as a as an element that's totally right up front, you know. And it it's it's like for me, this is a very art school thing. It's an exercise that. I can sort of impose on myself, maybe sometimes even with a time limitation, like I'm going to be done with this before. And then you see it and you go, you know, your mind is actually really clever and comes up with stuff subconsciously. And I don't know, I, this was gratifying to you. These are more of the same kind of things. This is a, called the couple. And 
this sort of verges on, for me, the, as I, I think that um, the most important things for me in all, in general, of all the art that I do are the things that paintings or drawings or sculptures that I end up having titles. And like the narrative, I mean, as much as I love the abstraction and the unconscious and pulling stuff out of the sort of the dark part of your mind, for me, the most important parts are, are the, the things that are nameable. And like th this being a couple, like I, like a female and a male married couple, and they're sort of bolted together. And that idea of a narrative in your painting, which I will get to, um, for me, that's kind of what it's all about. It's like, that's why, the, ironically, in a way, <laughs> using the drawing and, and the unconscious as a way to open up stuff is, strangely enough, for, a way for me to get at things that have a narrative. Instead of just writing a narrative out of my, the top of my head, like, oh, I'm going to do this, I'm going to talk about relationships. I don't know anything about relationships, you know. So you do something that's really sort of instinctual, and then you end up having a comment about relationships that are actually real, you know, sort of, I guess, Floridian or whatever. So um, this is a cardboard collage. I did a bunch of these over a year or so, where I take cardboard and cut them up and spray paint them and make this, this, for me this is like a little spaceship that a kid would make. Um, these are, this is sort of the interplay between a 2D collage and a 3D collage, 3D little sculpture. Um, and another trick, I think, in, while I'm talking about tricks and exercises and like building resource materials for bigger work is um, like working on when people like when people play they play speed chess, you know that really smart chess players sit down and they go and they tap the clock and they make a move and attack. That's a, it's a way for you to sort of work to exercise your mind like doing push-ups. And I think sometimes when I feel bogged down with a big painting and I'm just having to work away, and sometimes I go in my studio and go, I'm going to make something and I'm going to make a, make something from this in a, a drawing in an hour and then. And I'm getting something that you can yourself to do. Um, this is called Zeus. And I didn't title it until after it was done, you know, it was like a, and I gave this to my, my New York dealer, and I became really fond of it, you know, in the end. It's kind of a, I think doing stuff from from drawing or from your, 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 like your unconscious or whatever is a way to come up with. And then these are a series of sides that are just about collections. Um, I've always been a fan of um, collections of things, and I think it goes with this like human behavior. Um, this is a this is a cardboard relief thing that I made out of cardboard and painted chocolate like Easter Bunny brown, and it's a it's a fake shop with all these little items on it, um, and it relates to that collection. Um, so these, a lot of, I pulled all these shapes out of my sketchbook. You know, all those sketchbooks that have all those little automatics, most of them are sort of nonsense, but one out of ten, one out of five will be something like, what is that? Sometimes it'll be like, oh, that looks like a cat. Or, and other times it doesn't look like anything at all. Um, that's a group of inner creatures, you know, and hanging out together and they're wired together and I, you know you see, it goes right back to what you're doing in, in your studio when you see something like that. Um, this is just my studio wall. And some drawings have been up there forever because I haven't ever made anything from them. As soon as I make something from it, I generally take it down. Um, next door neighbor. This is a and this is the piece I made for um, a group show, and I, you know, I had, a, I had, a, like, I think two months to make this piece, and I started out um, thinking about that collector, the crazy collector who starts to catalog every single shape. And I would walk around my neighborhood and see fire hydrants and, you know, a refrigerator on the street for free or something like that. And I'd come home at the end of my I'd walk and my dog thing. I'm gonna make that. I'm gonna make that. I'd make like two or three in the, mo in the every day in the morning. And it just turned into this really great um, process. And then at the end of it, I made the shelf and um, kind of... Waiting, what are the pieces made of? These are all um, 
most of them are made from plaster with a little, I'm, you know, I would make a little cardboard mold. Basically, I had a, a utility blade with a snap-off blade, you know, those really sharp ones, and some hot glue. And so I would take a drawing and make a little mold, turn the mold upside down and put plaster in it. And sometimes I'd pour paint into the mold before I would um, make the, pour the plaster in. And most of them are casted. There's some, some of them are concrete, some of them are mortar mix. I'd go to like a hardware store in my neighborhood and that's sort of like my art supply store. There's wire and um, you know, some of them are more labor intensive, but generally I would make, and I made a lot more than these, I would pick the good ones that I like. And there's a couple ready mades in there. There's a nozzle and there's a, there's a, if you look, I don't know, I could go through each one of these and some of them end up being really large, turned into large sculptures. It's called Coulda, Shoulda, Woulda. And there's like 108 of them in there. and. Um, I think, you know, every once in a while, I mean, in my experience of making art, you, 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 you sort of hit this jackpot thing where you're, you wake up in the morning and you're like, all right, and you're super happy to go in your studio. And it's not always like that, but it's, if you look back on that time, you go, oh my God, that was really fun. And this, this was a, a piece that really was fun to make and um, turned out to be, I don't know, it was, it could, it could have launched, I could, I could sort of see this as like, a thousand, you know, make a giant shelf that like fills the whole gallery space, and that's a little one that came from the shelf. He's on there somewhere, and there's that that table that was in the backyard that had the shovel on the back on the back of it. That's the same table, and I saw I saw it one day. I was looking at the table. I was like, I used to play with play-doh when I was a kid, and you put the play-doh up against that little slide thing and extrude the play-doh through the star-shaped thing. And I thought I'm going to have that table with a giant piece of Plastics coming out of the top, and then did it. I did it. <laughs> you know, I looked at it after I was done. Like, eh, it's, I wasn't really that thrilled with the, with the result, but making it was really cool. And I ended up showing it at a, at a museum. And I don't know. It's it was an exercise in like I love the whole Robert Smithson thing of using these really heavy manly materials and getting it over your head with like. A lot of stuff is, um, this This goes back to um, the collection idea. And I've, I've come to understand, at least with my work in particular, there's a, they, the relief sculptures and the collages and the drawings and the little sculptures, are, they sort of reinforce each other. And they kind of make each other stronger and more beautiful in a way. So it's like they, singularly, you know, they could be kind of humdrum and lost, but you put them together in a group and they have this cast of, um, so there's a couple ones that are on um, plaster relief and uh, um, this was a while ago and I've done it, I've done it a number of times where you, I hang a lot of different, and it, for me it's a representative of the mind, you know, your mind is like, sort of, it's like this computer screen that you can scroll to the left and to the right and up and down and it goes in every direction and it's it's like this catalog and you have these images in front of you but right off to the side to the, up to the left and the right there's all these other images that are just right off the screen and you know, all you have to do is like scroll that way and all this stuff comes up and we, we tend to just sort of always look at the screen but this is kind of has that periphery um, this is a this is a drawing that I did when I was in you know I, I go to figure out drawing every other Monday and pay ten bucks and drink beer and sit around a bunch of people we just draw the nude and it's like that was my worst case scenario when I was in art school I hated it more than anything and um, part of the reason I hated it as I look back is that I used materials that I couldn't I, I don't like buying charcoal and I don't like newsprint in that way and I that's what I use in school and now of course I use stuff that I like I use paper that I like I use oily greasy drawing pastels and but this drawing you know was done in class and then that became a that painting. So and then I was trying to figure out what this painting was and I, and, um, I have chickens. <laughs> and when I got this one big white chicken, she was like the alpha chicken, the meanest chicken. Um, she was um, her name is Dorothy. And I had my nephews named all my chickens, and so. And the crazy thing is that my house, when I bought my house, there was a mean old lady that had Alzheimer's that owned the house, and I bought it from her. And all the neighbors thought she was she was really mean, 
and her name is Dorothy. And so my nephew named the chicken Dorothy. I was like, how did you come up with that? And then, so then I'm trying to figure out what this thing is, what this painting is. You know, I'm going from that. And I grid things up sometimes because I think that the original drawing, in your, when you're doing it, when you're making lines, before you know what you're making, and I didn't know where the head was, I didn't know what it was. I'm making lines that are just like, I'm going left, I'm going up, I'm changing colors. And then you look at it, oh, it's like this weird, and then you get this, and then I go, oh, and then the name came up, Dorothy, and then I, I realized that it's sort of like a chicken, and there's sort of a nest, and it, I just go, oh, it's so kind of interesting for me. It's not a, it's not a, one of those things that makes perfect sense, but it makes enough sense for me to go, there are things that I don't understand that are really valuable. And that's the drawing that gave me that. This is called Aardvark. And I don't know why they were born from why there's a flag there, you know? It's like, I, I, you learn to trust those instincts, like you're painting into the painting. And I, I often do with, with oil paint and with acrylic too, if you're fast enough, while the paint's still wet, you know, you're going to and you can cut a little window out of paper. Like this is the point goes back to the world. It's like you make a little stencil and, you just, and the stencil sticks to the paint. And I can paint the American flag with this really nice hard edge. And I pull the newsprint off and I have this, it's almost as if I got in there really closely and was really detailed with the flag, but it took me like 10 seconds. And so there's that. And that speed enables me to work fast enough on some parts of the painting to make up for the fact that most of this stuff is really m meditative and slow and like have to print the paper so it's just the right tone. I like to get the shadows, you know, I'll print all morning and I'll cut it and I'll look at it and go, oh, it's too dark, too much contrast. You know, because I know photographically what I'm looking for, you know, and something like that. But this is an object, I, I sort of see it as a, you know, probably six feet tall or something like that and it's, it's kind of, I don't know what the backside looks, but there's some sort of Thing in it, it's there's there's a ramp, and it's called Ardvark, so it's like it's got this kind of Hoover. I don't know. It's like a kind of a weird. I guess it's surrealistic, you know. And this is another drawing which became that. And this is another one of those things where I I saw I titled this bald eagle, and I didn't know why I thought it was bald eagle, but I looked at it. And, oh my God! It's like the American emblem with one wing missing. It's sort of like the decline of the American Empire. And I, I never really, I, I'm not a political artist, you know, and I don't really, of course I think about that all the time, but I don't know, it's, um, this, is, this is another drawing out of the sketchbook and it became Soldier. This is Plaster Relief. This took a lot of time, but um, this is basically those lines, it's straight lines and curves, you know, and I swear, when I was making this drawing, I'm, I'm totally not doing a soldier. And then I do that, and I look at it, and I go, I call it soldier, and I go, yeah, it's got the, like a revolutionary drum kit, arms, gun pieces, it's like two legs, and it's, I just think there's this, um, I'm a convert to this kind of um, looking at work, you know. This is a drawing that was just sitting around on the studio floor, and that turned into that. And this is called Mastodon. And it's like a, when I was living in New York, there were all these um, blue, all these blue awnings were popping up on all the stores at one, there was one year where it just, they just went around like a cancer, like all the stores, like the donut shop, and the, the cleaners, and the coffee shop, all these places where they put the blue, the big vulgar blue awning up. And it's the same blue as the blue tarp, you know, that we have. And I sort of imagine one of those awnings. You know, I, I look at that, I go, well, it's a, it kind of is like a drawing, a, a, an awning that's kind of on the run. They're trying to go out. <laughs> so that's what that is. And he's end, he ends up in, like, Yellowstone National Park or something like that. And this, the vulgarist, you know, urban architectural thing has escaped the city and now he's like living in the woods and running away like the Mastodon he's in it, he's in extinct and or like the Sasquatch where no one is seeing him, he knows it's I just think it's funny and weird. Um, this is called Head of Meteor. And that's faster. That's one of those things where I, I made the mold and then poured um, like ink into the mold. I always do something that's completely like 
experimental, like, I know, what, what, what happened if I put, you know, rather than oil paint versus acrylic paint versus ink versus oil, or just, you know, do, you, once you have the mold made, you can, um, you take a chance and do something, and often it doesn't work out. But this is a drawing I made when I was at my parents' house, and they were having an argument. So I'm sitting there at the butcher block table drinking a glass of wine, and I'm just going doodling. And it's a, for me, it's like, a, it's definitely an exercise that I've learned how to do in public and in sort of, a, not in an intentional way, but that ended up being this painting. And then I, um, this, I wanted to call this painting Howl. And then I initially went, I can't call it Howl because that's, you know, Alan Ginsberg's masterpiece of poem. And I, that would be such a pretentious, you know, but why, why did I want to call it Howl? And I realized that I wanted to call it Wolf. And it's like a wolf. And I don't, the thing is that I don't know, it's just, it's still like the beginning of a short story, you know, if you had a character, and then you were, I just had the character, and I don't know where the short story would go, I don't know, you know, the background for me, I often just don't, a lot of these are, they're basically paintings of sculptures, and so, since it's a sculpture, I think I kind of, I kind of cop out on really finishing the background in terms of like making it integral to the whole composition, but they, these paintings are, um, this is called the robot, and that became that. Um, see, this is how I sometimes I'll name the painting, I'll name that thing even in my sketchbook. Like, I'm, I'm sure you guys know about Jean Michel Basquiat, but Basquiat had a practice of um, inserting text into his paintings, and he would be in the studio, and I'm a huge Basquiat fan, because I think he was so, um, well, he's kind of a graffiti artist, graphic artist, but he, he was kind of a player in a way, and played the system, and um, it was just really brilliant what he ended up pulling off. And graphically, I thought I thought his genius was just in his graphic art. But he would often open up <coughs> reference books and like put put text right from the um, the book into the into the painting, and they mean they meant nothing. You know, it was like he was writing medical terms, and he would cross them out and do all this stuff. And, and uh, it loads the painting up with this fake intellectual baggage. And I think people look at it and go, oh. But really, it's just messing with you in a way. And it's kind of a, it's a way to use text in a painting, which is also sort of, anyway, I, I got into that doing, thinking about the title, or thinking of words as I'm making an image. And then um, and I ended up changing it from cousin to glum. I mean, um, <laughs> this is a napkin drawing out at, night, one night, and that turned into this thing. And this is called Hermit Crab. Why do you need help with this hat? This is, um, it's really small. I think this is uh, two feet by two feet. And, uh, and it, you know, the, the, it, the Hermit Crab, I, I, you know, I was brought up in Virginia, and we used to crab in the Chesapeake Bay, you know, with our sneakers and our nets and go through the seaweed and stuff, and we were going for blue crab, but uh, the hermit crab is a kind of a really interesting. I I didn't know what I was really making it until it was really close to being done. But I kind of fell in love with it after I thought after I realized that it was a hermit crab. Like the creature that's in here is using this particular thing to live in for a while, and then you would scuttle around in this for a while, and at some point you abandon it and go into another thing and cruise around that for a while. And so I. You got the character from here, from here, and that's like pretty much verbatim. I mean, I don't, there's some possible planes in here. You know, there's things that are on the drawing that, you know, I just put them in there not knowing really what, you just make them, and it ends up making sense in a way. But, because um, it's an impossible. The thing about making a two-dimensional sculpture is that you can do things that can't be done in 3D. <laughs> Um, and then you get to sort of play with the background, like why is there a bucket on that, what's that thing over there, it's the moon, it's nighttime, and it's like, they're generally always lonely and sort of solitary. I was in, when I was living in New York, I, I ended up seeing a, um, a shrink for a while because I was sort of in emotional trouble, and he said one day, he said, why do you got to bring in a painting? I was like, oh, I don't, don't want to do that, I mean, what do you, I, did, I, I was convinced that my paintings were completely non-autobiographical. 
and uh, <laughs> and he showed me this. I brought this one painting, and there was this shed that had one eye. It was hiding behind a bush, and I was like, and he goes, "There you are." And I went, "No, I, I, I kind of I disagree, but in the end, I thought he was totally right." I mean, it goes hand in hand with if you if you sort of subscribe to the you know netting out these subconscious drawings, you know these triggers from the back of your mind, then you have to sort of say, "Well." I'm, you know, I'm the one that's making them, so they have some sort of autobiographical content. I love, um, I sort of saw this as sort of a writer, you know, what's his name? Pinkham writer. with some kind of night scene with a cat. Um, and this is a speed painting I made from a, another painting which turned into this. This is called Senior. Um, a building which is like this old... I saw it as a building with using like a walker, and it's kind of got sort of swimming out. Um, I don't know this. So this is actually acrylic and polish, so the, the paper is printed, and the, the printing technique is really easy. I just use relief blocks, I, I make woodblock relief blocks, so I can print all my various um, textures, and then with with acrylic collage and with acrylic, you can use these papers really just right in there. You put the paper down with matte medium paint over them, and them. I never use a collage with oil paint, so these most of the, all these paintings that are are all done in um, this is called blue cactus, acrylic and collage. Now this is the connection between Picasso. The, I was reading all of the um, John Richardson books on Picasso. There's like four of them. He's working on the fifth one. They're just brilliant. And um, whatever you think about Picasso, they're, they're great. They're really great. As, I was just kind of blown away by, I read each one, and at some, you know, and then I'm, I'm walking into the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and I saw this, and of course, this is a, this is a painting of a surrealistic sculpture, and that's what, exactly what I was doing. And a really simple background, he didn't, you know, he did tons of these where he didn't really integrate the background with the foreground, he just made the thing, and it's sort of like an impossible shape, you know, rendered in, um, and I don't know, they're anthropomorphic. So, I don't know, that, that was kind of a, a revelation. This is called Cottage. Um, and there's an eye there, that little round window for me. It's like, this is sort of like a, these are more recent. This is called Hybrid. And this is a little bit more complicated and you know, I had a drawing and I was determined to make something from the drawing, so I, I got into it. This is a really large painting and it took me a long time to figure this out. And it's sort of a much more staid, kind of colder type idea. It's not funny, you know, I don't see an animal. There's not there's not a anthropomorphic connection at all. But I love those Picasso still lives and those I love the I I like that um, it was one of those I'm still trying to figure out what this where this is gonna go, this kind of work. I mean I'm actually thinking of setting out still lives, and this goes way back. It's called Grim Reaper. Um, this is the first painting I ever made where there was a building. We have a place in eastern Washington in the summertime, and I would drive my bike down this road, and I could see through the trees this this thing. And it was what it was was an old um, outhouse, and it looked exactly like the Grim Reaper, like as he was like walking through the woods. And so I went in there, the apartment bike went in there, and sure enough, it was an A-frame um, outhouse. And uh, that ended up, that was the beginning point of, of me doing these structures that were, um, the, the, the outhouse or the shed or the building was actually a creature. That was, that's why I put this in here. Even. This is like the first one. And waiting, this has collage in it, right? Like, is this part, like all the texture part? Yeah, these are all, the, all those papers are all hand printed. And they're, it's really a simple process, you know, I just take the, I cut the wood cut, like for the bark on the tree, and I cut the wood cut with the bark in mind, and then I'll paint the paper dark, and print the, paint the, the block a little bit lighter, and print, then I can re, I can sort of keep it registered on the block and reprint, um, or move it, so you can, with a, se a series of moves, you can make really, really kind of hyper-realistic paper, and it's all newsprint. Or, or like um, acid-free paper. And I let that sit on the studio floor, excuse me, and then it dries and I cut it. And I just take it to the painting, I look at it for a while, and then when it looks like it's the right thing, I just I put it down with matte medium. 
And I've been trying to make these things so they have more um, painting over them. Um, so they're not so anal. This is called the drummer. And my drummer asked me for this painting and I gave it to him and I told him to it. <laughs> this is a this is called Trellis and Sod, and this goes with my it goes back to the very first slide that you know we have an empathy for the inert. And this is sort of like a relationship of the trellis, sort of the more feminine, caretaking type element over this lump of sod. The sod is kind of anchoring the trellis and holding it secure, and then the trellis is, they're both, it's a symbiotic relationship amongst things, and it's kind of like a, I guess it's a projection, or um, I sometimes think about, this is in my backyard, I made a monster out of my mom, out of sod. Um, I want to finish up because I think I'm getting, this is called camp. Um, this is a really big thing. And this is, I have a little series of paintings that are all about big stuff. And this is a little vehicle that I had a drawing of, and I looked at it and I made a painting of it, and I realized that the front, of course, the front doesn't have a wheel, so it's sort of like this, there's stuckness in my art. This is called Quitter. And there's a wheelbarrow that just said, I'm done. But, and I realized that there was a big amount of dirt in the back. I mean, I, the, like, he's supposed to be moving all this dirt, he just goes, it's not going to, I'm not going to get it. <laughs> this, is a, this is called a foot house. And it's like, what's more ironic than a foot that's not moving? <laughs> because a foot is what makes you be able to move, and the foot is like, you know, and, I, and there's a little guy that's living in there, and he's just like, he's not coming out. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm a huge Philip Gustin fan, so I try to get, I love the way his paint is like this, they're like shingles on a roof, they're all, they're laid under, like this, this, this slice of paint is tucked underneath that slice, and you can't move this slice without moving that slice, so it's like they're so tough, and it's one, I realize that it's like this technique of, you can only do, Sometimes when I make a painting, I think I'm only allowing myself vertical strokes or horizontal strokes, no diagonal, no circles, no curves. It's like, as if you can only go like that and you can get um, this kind of rigid, tough, kind of stubborn. And this is the foothouse model. And this is all about the narrative where there's a, a I want to make this, you know, in the woods some, someday. This is like 30 feet long, you know, 15 feet tall, this giant. It's like a steamboat thing or something, and there's a captain's wheel behind that window, and there's a guy that lives in there, and he's got this, the two front flaps open up, and they tie up against the trees, those two things, and there's a big pottery studio in there, and he's like this madman living in this thing, and he thinks he's actually going and moving through space, and so he's up there at the wheel and moving around like Captain Ahab, and of course he's totally insane, and he's not going anywhere. So the, um, the, the narrative in my mind drove the, the image. And then, of course, there's, that's my nephew who built that. And I was like, oh my god, look at this. <laughs> and this is called the bovine. This huge sculpture I made for Greg and Sarah, my first show there. And this, the narrative of this is like, this was obviously um, a, 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 a seven, 1970s, 1960s camper, piggyback camper that's setting on a pair of saw horses, and I saw it in the field, the same exact shape, and I was like, why? I kept on stopping by the side of the road going, what is that? Why is that so cool? I took photographs and made drawings, and I ended up coming up with this idea that there's like this, this camper is like out in the field in the west and decides to go, it's called Bovine, um, the Oregon Trail Reverse. And so he's like, the Oregon Trail is kind of that idea, you know, people coming from, the Americans basically settling the West and taking over the whole West. And, and all the result that happens is what we have now, you know, looking around Seattle and all the buildings like, oh, well, it didn't work out so well. And then, so the, the, the bovine goes, I'm going back. So he's going to do the real work. He's going to go back in time to this, this fancy land where nothing, all pre-modern, all pre-technology. This is called Roman Helmet. And this is Owl. Keyhole head. And they're all just from little drawings that are in my sketchbook. 
Um, I think that's Harlequin, right? made out of plaster. Um, concrete doodle. This is called the new green. This is one of those things where, you know, I was, I was telling Wendy where I, I would make a lot of these paintings, like the wolf and all those paintings, and my friend, my friend Paul, who's like got way more art education than me, he finally came up and said one day, like, I had a drawing of this. And, you know, I, normally I would make a painting of this and make a fake background. And he goes, you should just build one of those. Why don't you build one of those? And I, and I, I again, I was insulted. I thought, what, you don't like the painting? I mean, why should I build it? And, and then I ended up building it, and it's a whole other, um, yeah, I like, I like building them. This is called Airport. And it's really big, and it's one of those, it's the same little, you know, it's curves. And if you created this out in a, like a checkerboard, each quadrant is curves or angles, curves, angles, curves, angles, curves, angles. And I just wanted to make this giant, benign, silent art that you can on the board, and everyone just walk by and not care about it. And it looks, it's supposed to look like it's made out of plaster, but I made it out of wood. And then I covered it with paint and sanded it a zillion times. And then I kept, I took the paint, the house paint, the white, and added um, matte medium to it and watered it down. So you, it just ends up, you can make it look like plaster if you work on it long enough. This is called, um, or that, <laughs> I cast it in cardboard and totally love that thing. This is a cabinet with a long knob. <laughs> you can't see how long that knot is unless you see it on the side. But really and I like to think, I, I, there's one slide that's missing in here, and, and it's all about, I love the idea of utility, where if you go into a really old factory from the old days, and you see a cabinet that's next to a machine, and the cabinet was specifically made to do this one job, and inside that inside the door there would be these weird auto, these parts, and then there would be some oily bags on the thing, and, like utility drives all these things, and um, this is called shop kit. And I found a bunch of stuff in my basement in my garage, and I just put them on there. I mean, pretty much everything on there is from my house. And uh, I imagined it as not art, as something that would be in some of my grandfather's basement, um, called choir girl. I was in the choir when I was a kid, and the boys wore black and white, and the girls wore brown and white. This is called Triclops, and this turned into that. See how that, that's really big. So the, the process of drawing, it's 100 drawings, you know, and you'll get one great drawing. Like doing these little, um, doing these, this was something that I just put together really quickly. Out of card, sorry, cardboard, and, and, you know, I did that one morning without, it took me like, I don't know, an hour or two before lunch. And I sat it on my studio wall, I mean on the counter, and I just looked at it for like six months. And I was like, why is that? It's got a third side that we can't see. And um, it's this weird sort of monster totem thing that, you know, when it turns <coughs> large, it's really kind of imposing. What's the big one made of? This, the big one's made out of wood. I try to copy the plaster as much as possible, but it doesn't have the same kind of um, feel to it. But I pretty much did the same exact shape. It was kind of tricky to make. Because it has these weird those those shapes are not totally they're not on the same plane, they're angled and they're, there's a vertical line and it's really kind of insane and complicated. Um, there's a wolf. This is the silver heart. This is like a little study. I don't think I'm, I don't want to go too long. What time what's the time? I think we're at nine. Okay, I got it. Oh, I mean, oh, I just, a couple more. Because <laughs> I want to leave. If you guys want to ask questions, I, I want to make room for that. This is more pop stuff. I made some washer dryer for a. a uh, I just wanted to show some stuff that's really out of the realm of what you might be expecting just from the poster. Um, this is my last second to last slide. This is exactly one little drawing that was like probably three inches by three inches in my studio and it sat on my wall forever. And I was like, why is that? Why haven't I chucked that out yet? And um, that turned into this. And that was this huge painting. This is called Wilderness. And I go on and on about it. But it's called. <clears throat> it's called what? It's called the Wilderness painting. And it's this. It turned. It changed. 
in the process of making it, but the tree stump um, is there. Um, I, I got rid of the dog and the guy, mm -hmm. and the, the guy ended up turning into this tree stump. So instead of the, the trunk is actually, was supposed to be like this. There's this story, I had a show in New York once, and this woman was a, the review was totally spot on. She said, it was like on my side of the other side of the mountain, or my side of the mountain, this book that I read when I was a kid. And she totally nailed it, because I was like one of my most influential books as a, as a kid. And so if that was going to be the habitat, he was, you know, that kid lived in a hollowed out window log. And then the log turned into the artist. And so this big trunk was making sculpture, and then there's paintings against the tree. Um, it ended up being this really weird trip. But um, anyway, there's things I left out. Um, that's is that kind of like a wilderness version of one of those pictures of Dustin on the punch drive? Oh, yeah. With all the cigarettes? And yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, I, and there's also Carol Dunham, who does those kind of, um, those really uh, stumpy looking characters. What's the hangman's noose in the drawing book? I, I got rid of it. It was like a joke. <laughs> I, I don't know why. It's like, this woe is me, some dude living with his dog. And I don't know. <laughs> I put a cigarette out in the top so it was a huge burning out thing. And I don't know, I was just being kind of... Sometimes I try to make it, push it to the point where it's just super silly. And I, don't, um, I ended up, of course, not doing any of that. But um, this kind of shows you how, you, with the acrylic that technique, which I'm trying to get away from because it's so, labor, so labor intensive, but you, there's no ending to how crazy you can get with the realism with it. I mean, you can make whatever you see. You can make a block for it. You know, if you're patient enough, you can make a block that prints what you want. And you know, I think it's kind of crazy. I I don't think that's something I want to do that much more. But and, you know, when you use that as a background, I want to take this kind of paper and then maybe paint more onto it. Or I don't know where I'm going right now. I'm working on a large commission right now, and it's taking me months. So I, all of my regular painting thinking and stuff has been sort of put on ice. Could you just tell us what is collage on that and what's paint? Yeah, all the greens, like, all the green, all the everything is printed except for those blocks of color. The green bill, um, all the red lines are painted. Um, only those solid areas of color are actually acrylic paint, and everything else is printed. So when you say you can make a block, what do you mean by making a make a block out of what? I, I generally the, the best, the easiest block. To use is I just go to the store and get birch plywood. I get the half inch plywood. Birch is, <coughs> birch is the it's expensive. It's more expensive than the regular fir, but the fir is harder. If you just get regular plywood, you can use it. But birch is like super soft and even there's no grain to it. You can just cut it like butter. And if you buy half inch, you can do both sides. And so I basically use <coughs> I cut out the negative. So um, I draw into it with a either a marker or a paintbrush or whatever. You just paint what you want to see and then you cut out, you'll cut out the voids that you don't, whatever you don't want to show. So mm -hmm. if there's a line of like the maple leaves, you, the positive of the maple leaves would be left on the block and everything else surrounding the leaf would get rid of. And so for maple leaves, I'd cut like three different sizes of the maple leaves, the ones that were up front, and the ones that were for, for the back and then maybe the really distant ones, I'd have three different blocks for the maple so I could have it, um, you know, and then I, got, I get really into, like, the technical, you can go crazy, like with ferns, you know. You print one, you make one block for the ferns, and as you print, I'm, I'm printing really low contrast and dark on the same piece of paper as, as I'm printing, like, the third or fourth or fifth print on the same paper, I'm going lighter and lighter and more and more contrast. So the last two colors, the dark, the darkest dark and the lightest light, I print that and that's the front of the picture plane. And everything else that's in the cracks behind that, they're, they're darker and lighter, they're like less contrast, just like the way it works in your... So you can get really, you can get really sort of um, close to that illusionistic thing, but for me it's like, a, it's so exhausting because like when I'm, I think of real serious painting is like it's a frontal, it's like a boxing match where you're working on a painting and you're, you face it and you work on it. And with this kind of technique, you're spending most of your time with your back to the painting and you're cutting and you're printing raw material. And then you face the painting. 
And I think you get disengaged and too much time goes by when you're just doing the mechanical work. So. But you know what, like these paintings are really stunning to see. And I think part of it, like when I was talking about being enthralled, is you, when you look at them, you're not sure what you're taking in. Like what, <coughs> what is real, what is painted, what is collage. And so it's a really kind of engaging experience. And naturally it's hard to see it when we're looking at the slide because everything's kind of flattened out. But I think there's something about that technique and that stays with you. Yes, no, I think it's, it's been, for me it's been worth, worth it. But I, I get paranoid about, not paranoid, but I think that if you, the, I'm suspicious of, of process, you know, when it's, I find myself, I, I'll spend all morning cutting a block and I'll turn it and look at it and I'll go, this isn't what I want, you know? And I, in that time, that whole, like, six hours, I could have, like, rifled off a really badass painting out of oil paint <laughs> without it and just, like, and I see, when you know, I look at Philip Gusson, that the, the really kind of macho painting that I love, I think he doesn't do this stuff. He goes, and he just, he goes into a studio at night and drinks a bunch of booze and makes a painting. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't, I don't want to do that, but I mean, it, there's something to be said for not getting caught up in a process that is so, um, you know, labor intensive. Yeah. But then they... you get a lot of, you get a lot of stuff. I mean, I think drawing in your eye, you know, when you have these sort of, these textures that look like real wood, I mean, it, it sucks a lot of people right in, and then you have them as an audience, and then you can sort of do stuff, so I, I think it's a, I, it's, it's a lot more technical than in books, actually. I wish I could have you all in my studio and see how, it's like Fred Flintstone, it's very basic. How big are those, say the ones that, the wood, like how big are those? The blocks, blocks? I, I generally take, they're um, 18 inches long and 12 inches wide. Those are all the blocks, and I have in my studio. I have like a hundred blocks. I have, I have blocks that I made in my first paintings. You know, when I started doing this like 15 years ago. So I have, I have brick, ten different ones of plywood. I've got maple, cedar. Um, I've got gravel. I've got all sorts of building materials: concrete, grass, flowers, dandelions. You know, American flags. Every every time I've, every every time I've made a painting, I have, I've made a block and. Um, so there's a lot of blocks. Can you go back to them and use them in new paintings? Yeah, I'm, I'm, this... I'm supposed to have a show in um, <coughs> at Salem next next January. So coming up, and there's this really beautiful atrium in the in the end, and he's going to show a lot of older work, and it's going to be like this comprehensive show. And we're talking about what we're going to do, and I said, I know what I, I always want to make this quilt painting where I'm going to take all the paper, and I've saved all my papers. Mm -hmm. I've got a box that's this deep. So I can go all the way back to the fairy, the, the Grim Reaper painting, and I have the outtakes from that. And I can, I'm going to make a giant quilt pattern on the wall, and just and use all my papers. It's kind of like a, you know, when you take quilts from all these different baby clothes and all these different periods. So it'll be kind of super sentimental, but I think it's, I'm going to try it. It's, it's a good place to do it because it's in Salem. <laughs> I wouldn't do it in New York; I'd probably get killed. I'm sorry, that, but there's two, three, three slides before this where this looks like there was a tarp on the wall. Yeah, so I'm curious well, I was about running that. out of time. This was a major yeah. piece. For, I, this was a major piece for me, and uh, I, I didn't want to. I could talk all night about this one thing. I mean, I, I got into a group show at the Tacoma Art Museum, and it was a netty. It was like this one of those things where they invite you to your your nominee for an award. And then the guy comes to your studio and goes, okay, what do you want to put in the group show? We'll all get to the group show. Um, I mean, they, they choose one award winner, but everyone else, you're all invited to be in the show. And so he came to my studio. I didn't have that much going on in the studio, but I had this little drawing in my sketchbook that was made from ballpoint pen. And uh, it was of the blue tarp in ballpoint pen. Like, and I always thought, oh, I'm going to make a painting of, of the... Of the, of the chart, full size. And it was always in my back of my mind, like, I'm going to do that. And for me, it's like a sort of a Jasper Johns thing, where Johns did the flag, and he basically took the flag pretty much life size and rendered it. Um, and I thought, it's a pop idea that some, someone's going to do it. I know someone's going to do it. And I figured, like, it's just a ticking time bomb that's going to go off. And I thought, <laughs> I told the guy, I said, I want to make this, um, I want to make this blue tarp for the show, and he goes, well, let's see, and then, you know, he called me up the next week and said, I think you should make a blue tarp, and I had, um, like, four weeks to make it, so I stretched up the, I stretched up the bar, 
you know, that's eight by twelve, which is the, you know, that's what you get. If you go to the hardware, I went, I went to the hardware store, I bought the guitar, and I unfolded it, and I was like, okay, and I copied the fold pattern with um, burlap and collage, and then I started to do the blue tarp without um, doing the way I ended up doing it. You can't see it in this painting, but I ended up having this total panic because I got to the point where I was just using my regular mon my regular mono printing technique is like you paint one piece of paper blue, a darker blue, and another piece of paper lighter blue, and you can take them while they're still wet and you can mate them, and you can pull them apart, and they have both print on each other, and you get this kind of really nice. I thought that was going to be my blue tarp surface, and it looked like crap. It did not. So I ended up having to. I cut. You know, the blue tarps are actually woven. So I cut a really tiny grid of the lines. You know, I took a straight edge and cut. They're like eighth inch, a perfectly mechanical grid. And then I mixed up four different blues. It took me like a week. I had to choose the blue, and then I had four different blues of painting. <laughs> painting the, you know, this is so technical. But I ended up getting this. You could see the grid, and it looked like it was woven. And then I started collaging onto the the substructure, which was the folds, and then. And then I got the blue all done, I thought, you know, um, started making marks on it, like, and it got into, I got into this kind of side Twombly thing where um, I was making these crazy, and I, you can't see, but I started drawing into it and going insane. I was, <laughs> it ended up being really um, super cool. It was one of those things like the coulda, shoulda, woulda shelf where, and the, there's like three or four times in my life where I've done something where it sucked me right in, and I'm actually doing one of those right now. And you're so, you got up in the morning and it was like, you're so, just sort of like a vacuum. You're like in your studio and you're working on it. And you close your eyes at night and you can still see what you're working on. Mm -hmm. um, so is each of the, the grid, is that one piece of paper or is it each grid? No, it's kind of complicated. I basically take the, the grid, the, the grid block that I made for this was probably two by two. And so you take the piece of paper and I print it and I'm just looking for a good chunk of it. So the perimeter of the piece of paper you know, is, is totally not even printed right. So in the end, you put that on the dryer and that dries, and that'll cut out like the choice chunk. And since you're using the same exact colors, you can see the different, you can see where the where the papers break. You know, it's, you can see these little, and I generally stick to the grid when I'm doing that kind of stuff. So there's no angles. So, so whenever I would put in a piece of paper, it was either square or rectangular. And then, you know, you make mark over it. As soon as you make a mark over, a, a break like that, it totally, um, it trumps the, the mark, I mean, the, uh, the break in the paper, so. Um, I know, I got, it's like this weird s sky at night thing where I was looking at seeing stars, and <laughs> there's masking tape on there, and I actually was, I would go in my studio and, like, take a paintbrush and make it, get it wet, and I'd turn my back to the painting and flip it behind my back, and... And look, and look at the mark, and if I like the mark, if it looked like a real mark, I'd leave it. If it didn't, I would wipe it off to try to get that weird um, accidental. And it's like, it sucked me into this whole other kind of artwork that I'm, I mean, I was never really a, now I love Cyclone, but I don't know, there's a lot of art that you start to really appreciate someone, a different, a totally different kind of art when, when you're doing something that's sort of more of like a, it's almost like a commission, you know, you're doing something that's... Anyway.